Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. Uh, this is, of course, our main episode that drops every single Wednesday. And we are, well, not quite halfway through our journey of the original uh, Night of the Demon series. And uh, we're going to do Night of the Demons 2 here this evening with uh, Gary Hill. Very excited to talk that movie. And then we move on to part three and then the remake. So that's what's ahead this month on The Dark Parade. Just want to say uh, thanks to everyone who subscribed to the show and downloaded the show and shared the show uh, in the month of October. It was a great launch month uh, for us, but I am an ambitious sort. So please, if you would, be sure that you are subscribing and Sharing sharing is really the big thing. If uh, there's a particular episode you like, uh, please share it around on your social media feeds. And if you know somebody in the market for a horror podcast, turns out I got one. Uh, and, and, and point them that way. Uh, also, if you haven't done so, please leave a review on uh, Apple Podcasts. That uh, makes a world of difference as it happens. So with all that said... Um, what is ahead uh, for the, the Dark Parade, not just on this episode, but in the near future? Well, uh, not only do you have Night of the Demons here on this very episode, come Friday, you will have a, uh, a, a new episode of The Heart of Horror with Kate Pollock and myself, and we're joined by Court Psyops to talk a movie called Spontaneous, as well as discuss uh, a little bit about First Loves, which is, uh, is kind of wonderful. And uh, then uh, another Sinister Sunday on uh, Sunday. So if you uh, would like to come join us for that, that is on youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. And, uh, and there uh, you can hang out as we talk about some recent news and just chat about things in general. Here recently, it has become very much about figuring out who and who is not a master of horror based on a sliding scale that uh, we are developing and soon to be trademarked so enough of that Uh, that's what's ahead for the show um but uh sit down relax get yourself a a hot toddy in this chilly season and enjoy maybe my favorite entry in the night of the demon series uh night of the demons 2 here we go All right, and with me for Night of the Creeps Du, uh, as it is known in France, is the uh, the lovely, the talented Gary Hill of uh, Cinema Beef, and uh, well, I mean, you do two drink minimum, you do everything. So, Gary, first of all, welcome. Second of all, what am I leaving out? What what is all the stuff that you do do? Well, do do. There's stuff that's out there, but nothing that's uh. There's there's, there's active stuff and inactive stuff but uh look forward to november where i'm sure this is going to be released so we should be already in the mix but i i do um multiple shows to overburden myself but you know once you get on the microphone you kind of enjoy this shit and it's a it's a stress reliever people in a in a stressed world um burning for springwood which is uh basically we watched the freddy's nightmares episode so you don't have to with uh mike merriman and suzanne capaletti Two drink minimum commentaries. Uh, the lineup has has been up and down, but it mostly has been me, Cameron, Scott, and whoever else wants to come on. Um, Cameron does uh, cinema degeneration. Uh, it's it's kind of like you, Bo, with your dark parade. It's it's, it's like a, a smorgasbord of, 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 of a podcast. He does have any different ones than that under that banner. Um, woo. Sorry, last call of torches is uh, Walter Hill. All about Walter Hill's films. We're doing them one by one. Myself, same uh, mentioned Cameron Scott uh, and Lee Russell of the "They Must Be Destroyed on Sight" podcast. That's been fun so far. I'm leaving something out. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that. I mean, that feels complete, but also it, you do like five thousand shows. And then uh, one make him come back. We, we've, we've talked about this, and I'm I'm excited. Because I miss this person. Um, a show I did a long, a long time ago that doesn't exist right now. So if you are, are a cinema beef completist, 
you'll know I, I did a show with a British girl once upon a time, and we might get back together again to do that. So I'll announce that here. Oh. You know, so l- l- listen to that. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, man, uh, like I said, thanks for doing this. Let's get into it. This is the sequel to Night of the Demons. I keep wanting to call it Night of the Creeps because I'm obsessed with that movie. But Oh, and you should be. Yeah. Uh, but Night of the Demons 2 takes place six years after the events of Night of the Demons. And it starts off with kind of a cold open where you get some door-to-door religious types showing up at Hull House like you do. You know, trying to convert uh, people into Christianity and whatnot. And... Uh, they are greeted by none, none other than Angela, still played by Amelia Kincaid, who does it for all three of these movies, all three of the original movies. And uh, she invites him in for a bite of cake, which is uh, a, an old cobwebby wedding cake what's got uh, a lady and a devil guy on top of it. And then the religious types decide that they're going to make a break for it. And then she demons out and then slashes them up with a cake knife. So, you know, that's how you, that's how you start a movie. That's all right. Well, it's not CG blood. I can tell you that though. They have a lot of fun with the blood splashing and not showing anything, but, uh, this, this establishes right away. Cause she already had like a plucky personality in the first one, like making jokes, but she, she's going to go full, uh, Freddy, she well in this opening scene she goes like full Freddy kind of because she she makes the joke, uh, oh come on it's the devil's food yeah I love that line and uh, <laughs> yeah yeah the, and it you know it's one of the things I kind of like about Night of the Demons too is that it really does lean into the the humor of it and the the schlockiness of it where the first movie feels like it's trying to be, I mean it's still very silly at times. But this movie gets very silly at times, and and it sort of turns everything to eleven. Um, still got great effects work from Steve Johnson, which I appreciate. And the director this time isn't Kevin Tenney; it's a guy named Brian Trenchard Smith. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, and, uh, right. who directed like uh, a Dead End Drive In and Turkey Shoot and BMX Bandits. And uh, what else? Uh, Leprechaun 3, you know, Leprechaun 4 the, in space. One of the better Leprechauns, and I have fun with Leprechaun 4 in space. It's so stupid, but I, I have a good time with it. But um, I, I enjoy Brian, Brian Trenchard's miss uh, output. And when I met um, Amelia Kincaid, um, only one time over the years, surprisingly, this is last year, she... Um, I, that's like the first question I asked her. Like, what, what's the first? What was it like working with Brian Trenchard Smith? And because it's but the second one's my favorite one, and she agreed that the second one's her favorite one too. So, yeah, I, there's some pretty great effects work, especially at the end of this, um, where it, it kind of goes. I mean, full nightmare on Elm Street, and that's kind of the arc of this series. Is the further you get into the Night of the Demon series, the more it's like a, a Nightmare on Elm Street sequel. And uh, Night of the Demons Two is the the real like transformation point where it goes from where in the first movie it's just demons they get demoned out and they're like, Bleh. and in this movie there's a little bit more of a a sense of like these kids kind of get what's coming to them there's a little bit of a morality play at work i think and but yeah so uh we we have our our opening scene with angela hacking people up and whatnot and then um we cut to our 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 school which is the saint rita's academy which is sort of a school for bad kids or troubled kids and uh, it's a Catholic school run by, uh, there's Father Damien, um, which of, of course is a real wink and a nod kind of name for the priest, um, as well as the, uh, the, the sister, um, who is Sister, sister Gloria. Gloria. Yeah. Sister or, Gloria. Or, or Sister Gloria is the kid's caller. Yeah. Yeah. 
and we we meet our guys first of all which is uh you've got rick and johnny and i mean it's random guy names essentially but you know they, they, they are interchangeable and they are almost completely irrelevant to the story these dudes other than they want to they're looking out a window to look at some tits because apparently across the way is the uh the girls dorm um and they're wandering around in various states of undress and uh so they're gonna look at it and and basically we establish hey there's gonna be a dance the next night right right for the beginning it earns our rating because um full frontal nudity if you like that sort of thing because it happens in this movie yeah oh for sure well i mean it was in the original night of the demons they've got it here i think there's full frontal in the third one as well if memory serves um you know brian trenchard smith said of the movie that hey this is you know i knew the kind of movie i was making um also the producers uh the the film you know people behind uh, the money on this movie knew the kind of movie they wanted and they wanted it to be gory and they wanted to have a lot of tits and that's the movie that we've got and so yeah but right off the bat he's like guess what everybody boobs so, so you get it immediately as soon as soon as you come away from the credits after the cold open you are in boobs in boob land and but after we establish that we also get introduced to our our girls of the film which are kind of our main character bb uh as played by christy harris you've got um terry who is played by mrs ben stiller christine taylor and then you've got uh shirley who is played by zoe trilling is uh is the actress's name and they're all uh sitting around talking about the dance and in comes mouse who is the much as her name or her real name's melissa but she is the shy reserved girl that it turns out is the younger sister of angela um who of course is our possessed demon at the center of the movie and I and I like all of the female characters to one degree or another. Like Shirley is my favorite just because she is the most conniving of them. Oh yeah. And and Zoe Trilling kind of blows my mind that she did not have a bigger career than she did because I think she's kind of great in this. She, she plays like the mean girl real well and like not in like a cheap way. And although she is pretty cheap, I'm pretty sure the guys we meet later. Uh, pretty much, you know, have had her in one shape or form, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, she's definitely, if she is not kind, kind of the slut of the school, she certainly enjoys that reputation, you know? But when she's pressed, like, there, there's a whole bit where they're in class, and um, she asks uh, Sister Gloria about what fellatio is, and Sister Gloria is like, well, I don't know, Shirley. How about you tell us what is fellatio? And she gets kind of embarrassed by it. Like, she's the kind of girl that is a lot of talk, but as soon as you throw it in her face, uh, it seems to, like, she can be put in her place very easily, you know, like many bullies can be. And she yep. is kind of a bully. Oh, she is, yeah. She's like the leader of the, th the three female leads, if you will. Yeah, for sure. Like, BB and Terry kind of do what Shirley wants them to. And and BB is probably the most innocent of of them all, even though nobody in this... I, I mean, other than Melissa, a.k.a. Mouse. Um, other than her, everyone else is, you know, a, a pretty typical teenage girl. Everybody in this movie is horny as hell. Uh, and BB is no different. But... Um, yeah, and it turns out she's having, Mouse is having uh, nightmares about Angela coming to her and being like, hey, I'm still alive. And Oh, and by the way, her parents killed themselves. So not only did Angela go missing and her body was never found, her parents both killed themselves because of this, 
leaving Mouse entirely alone in the world. Which there's is a lot of like there's like a little exposition like within like the first twenty minutes, like you just get Angela in the opener, but they, they tell you I think in the when they're telling the story behind around the lighter, the candle lighter is that the other bodies are found but they were mangled in nothing, basically. So it, so Angela only inhabits the house. I think that that's set up within like 30 seconds of exposition and I can appreciate that they don't really dive too far into it oh for sure for sure and uh, Sister Gloria is kind of the defender of Mouse here she, you know she's painted in the upfront as kind of being overbearing and all but I think she's really just trying to get these bullies to leave this poor girl alone uh, but yeah she's you know quick with the the yardstick and whatnot, uh, played by Grams from Charmed. Oh, okay. I, ne- I never watched Charmed. I, I knew it was a thing. I just never actually sat and watched it, which is surprising for me because I watched a lot of that, you know, fantasy type TV. Yeah, it was one of those things. I can't remember how I fell into it. I think it was just on in the afternoons or something when I was working. And so uh, when I g- either. I'm pretty sure it was on when I got home and I would throw it on in the afternoons just because occasionally there would be like, oh, there's a demon. And, you know, I'm a sucker for anything that's like, oh, there's some devil shit in this show. <laughs> so hey, no, no, no judgment here, man. This is the guy who became obsessed with, obsessed with Riverdale. So it's uh, still still there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had riverdale i tried with and uh just kind of fell off of it towards the end of the first season um Mm -hmm. but it it, uh, you know again ain't no shame i uh just didn't land with me but i i kind of got it i was like i this feels like twin peaks if you've never seen twin peaks yeah you're not wrong um where are we oh yeah, yeah yeah so uh it turns out that Shirley and one of the other dudes are fucking around on the tennis court and sister Gloria find by the time she shows up, they're literally just rolling around on the ground and sister Gloria has got her catchphrase, which is leave a little room for the Holy ghost. But she sees this mess. She's not even bothering with the catchphrase. She's like, both of you horny bastards are grounded. You cannot go to the dance because it looks like it, if we put you two in the same zip code, you two are going to start fucking. Yeah, yeah. Back, back to Shirley, though, that, that scene, you know, where they're trying to get all horned up, it, it's kind of mutual horned up in this, in this scene because they, they bounce the basketball at her and she catches it perfectly between her legs and she keeps it there. It's like, come, come and get it, big boy. So... It's 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 like what court would call a thank you movie because I think the hoardiness is mutual. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah yeah yeah. I mean, like I said, everyone in this movie is is down to fuck. It's just a question of like we need the right circumstance and we will totally get down. Oh yeah. Um, and so after they get banned from this Halloween dance. Shirley also wants to do some, a little bit of a prank on Mouse. And so she steals this book from Perry, who is the local (laughs) demonology nerd of the school, who uh, spent all of last month's allowance on a book all about conjuring demons and whatnot. And we get a look at him doing uh, a kind of a ceremony in like the sacristy of this Catholic school where he manages to conjure the demon of Angela, which comes out of a mirror at him. And then uh, the, the local priest, Father Damien interrupts this and is like, Hey, knock off all this demon shit. First of all, it's not real. And second of all, it's borderline, you know, blasphemous here at this Catholic school. And I and I like the fact that our main priest is sort of of that, you know, evil is a, a concept, not a physical thing kind of priest. It's that modern view of Catholicism. 
is rare in a film like this because usually they're either all in or th- this guy's kind of skeptical and I could appreciate that. Yeah, and Sister Gloria, as it happens, is the more traditional Catholic that's like, no, 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 this shit is for real, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so Perry is uh, on lockdown too, but uh, Shirley sees his demonology book and swipes it from him. And so when they decide that they're going to go to Hull House for this party, because they're like, hey, everybody's at the dance, so let's go have a party at Hull House. And by the way, bring Mouse with you, even though they don't say it's Hull House initially, and, and this knucklehead named Z-Boy like switches the sign and whatnot uh, to get them there. But they drag Mouse along saying it's going to be a party. So she dresses up like a clown, but without any makeup. And uh, and, and so we end up getting all of our crew, uh, including, um, is it, uh, I can't remember. It, one, there's a thug that uh, Shirley knows whose name I can't remember now. I think it's Rick. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think Rick is the the thug. Um, But he's kind of the older guy. Like, Rick is definitely the guy that's buying everybody beer. Yep. And so Rick and Shirley pull up to take everyone to Hull House in his, you know, charger or whatever. And so off they go. But when they get to Hull House, Mouse freaks out and decides she's going to stay in the car. Because she doesn't want to go inside. Because, of course, this is where her sister died. That's totally reasonable. And so uh, once they get to Hull House, Shirley has, like, a cat that they're going to perform a ritual with. And they're going to do this whole ceremony and stuff. But in the meantime, um, BB and Terry are like, well, we're going to go off and explore the house with our respective dumb, dumb boyfriends. And so immediately, uh, Terry, Christine Taylor's character, she is not as down. Like she's a, a real second base kind of girl. And she doesn't want to go any further. But BB, our main character, who you would assume to be the virginal character by virtue of the kind of role she plays in the movie, totally down to fuck right away. And I... Anyway, so she ends up getting naked upstairs in some dirty-ass bedroom with her boyfriend. Uh, and, and they get down and we do get a very responsible shot of him opening a condom before they completely, you know, well, he's the better guy of the two, you know, you got Kurt, who's the, the bigger horn dog than Johnny and Johnny's, uh, I guess that's why BB chose him. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, he plays it cool enough, I guess that he and BB end up having sex and, once uh they finish up also he goes downtown which i also appreciate in a movie where after after using a condom for vaginal penetration he he does a thank you uh kind of lingus move which i again i appreciate that's a that's a, a selfless move on his part he is a generous lover he couldn't quite get it done so he he finished her off yes he is he is a generous lover And, uh, yeah, so then Shirley calls everybody down for the big ritual. And they, they have managed to get Mouse in the house after this knucklehead Z-Boy shows up with a werewolf mask and kind of scares her into the house. And they have her tied up and laying on this altar and are about to it it seems like stab her and and spill her blood to conjure angela but instead like finally i think it's uh rick who steps in to stop this not rick i'm sorry it's uh um bb's boyfriend johnny yeah 
So he steps in to stop the actual blood spilling. And uh, it turns out that it's a fake knife, that they weren't really going to hurt her. It was all just a big prank. And everyone decides, like, all right, well, now that the jig is up, also, we don't have any music or beer or anything to do, so we're just going to go home. Except uh, Z-Boy goes wandering off where he runs into Angela. And Angela gives him the old uh, demon tongue. And he makes noises like Shemp. <laughs> you don't you don't remind me of the scene in Up in Smoke where the girl snorts the, the cleanser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is her. It, it's very silly. And so Shirley is calling for Z-Boy. And there's a, a scene I really like, or a little moment within the scene, where she's lighting her cigarette off of this gargoyle on the stairs. And it's as if the gargoyle blows out the match before she can light her cigarette. That's a nice touch. Yeah. And, and this is the point where she's like, fuck this and leaves. But the directorial joke, of course, being as soon as she says like, fuck him, you cut to him being fucked by Angela. (laughs) Plowed hilariously. Okay. Yes. (laughs) And BB, meanwhile, has swiped uh, as they're leaving she has swiped a tube of lipstick the tube of lipstick uh one one presumes from the first night of the demons that got inserted into linnea quigley's booby and uh she starts to apply it but then it kind of jets out of the tube at her and she freaks out and throws it and Shirley sees it and is like, where'd you get this? And she's like, well, I got it at Whole House. And Shirley's like, well, it's mine now. So they all get back to campus while this dance is going on. Meanwhile, Perry has let Sister Gloria know, hey, I think a bunch of the kids that you grounded took Melissa up to Hull House And so Sister Gloria leaves the dance to go see what's up with the kids that she has grounded. Which gives enough time for Shirley and her crew to show up at the dance. And Shirley decides that she's going to go to the bathroom to freshen up before they get down with some non-spiked punch and one assumes some striper. Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, out of the lipstick tube comes the kind of very thin dick looking thing that started to come after BB when she first opened the lipstick and it's it's a good effect but it looks straight up like a purplish very thin dick yeah well it goes in her lady parts so I imagine that's what they were going for I mean, exactly what happens. It it crawls up her leg and goes into her lady parts, and then she kind of falls on the ground looking all stoned, and then a bunch of smoke comes out of the lipstick tube, and out comes Angela. Which is, you know, a theme they explored in the first film, that that they, once they get past the underground stream that Hull House is, is, is protected by or barriered by, they, they bring something out of... Uh, out of Hull House, which is probably why they were allowed to leave, because they're bringing Angela to the party. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It is right. It, it, it's a riff on, hey, the demons can't cross the water of their own accord, but in theory, if you carry them over in lipstick tubes, it's cool. Well, it was a personal item. So it, it's, I, 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 I like that this is not for nothing to say, hey, I guess they just changed the rules now and she can just get out. No, these are these are established rules of the first film. Yeah. And and uh Brian Trichard Smith has stated like he was trying to sort of expand the lore and mythology of the Night of the Demon series, um, but also pay homage 
uh, and make sure that he was a- as close to the original as possible. And it's also written by the same guy, a guy named Joe Augustin, uh, wrote both of these. And so after Shirley gets uh, possessed, Angela throws a kiss on her too to really demon her up. And then Angela and Shirley go out to the dance and begin dancing. Like, there's kind of a repeat of Angela's. It's not exactly the same as the dance that she did in the first one, but it is. Yeah. But it it is her doing that thing of like. That that was her chosen profession for a while, though, was that she was a dancer. So she just gets to showcase her dancing skills. Yeah. and, And apparently, so was Zoe Trilling, although she doesn't get to really show off nearly as much as Amelia Kincaid does in this, but. Um, but yeah, both of them are dancing all sexy like to the death metal that is now playing. And what it's BB's boyfriend that gets kind of seduced by it. And so he starts kind of making eyes at Angela and she's making eyes at him. And uh, is it Rick who gets killed next? I'm trying to remember the order of murders because. <laughs> I think I think it's Rick. Yeah, because, um, this is one of my favorite deaths of the whole film coming soon. Well, so Sister Gloria shows up, and and a scene I really like where she shows up and sees uh, Angela there, and she says, "You don't belong here." Uh, and and this is one of the things that I like most about the movie is once Angela is kind of out and starting to fuck with people that. Sister Gloria seems to know what's up right away. Well, the the line delivery alone, and it's, it's, it's like, hey, this is a, a straight to VHS movie. But her line delivery in that particular line, like, you don't belong here. She gives she gives a look at her like, not only are you a terrible slut, but there's something wrong with you spiritually. You need to get the fuck out of my school, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's really good. And so we've got. Angela, she takes off. She just kind of leaves. And I think she takes care of uh, Christine Taylor, Terry, by just, she finds, oh, we'll, we'll get to that whole scene. Let, let's talk about Rick first. Because Rick is there with Shirley, who is starting to get the demon eyes. Oh, yeah. And she rips open her top Mm -hmm. and is rubbing her boobs and Rick goes in for a feel of his own and then her boobs turn into hands that grab him which I tell people reason to watch Night of the Demons too well two reasons Sister Gloria for one thing and that that girl's boobs turn into hands and murder somebody yeah (laughs) And apparently acid boob hands because it oh, kind of yeah. melts his hand some. And she, she burns his ass up real good. Yeah. And so that takes care of Rick. And then you go over to Christine and the dude that she's with and they're making out in his car in the backseat of his car yet again. And he's getting a little handsy and she's like, no, no, no. Uh, you know, second base is as far as I go. And so as they continue making out, Angela's hand comes up from the seat cushion yep. and opens up this dude's fly and starts rubbing him off. Uh, and he's one of my favorite lines of the movie is him saying, careful now, we don't want to strike oil too soon. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. And, uh, and Terry is like, what? Wait a second. And she, it's one of those like, hey, wait a second. My hands are here. Somebody's rubbing me off. Oh, shit. There's a demon in the car. And sure enough, Angela is like outside the window and then they run off. But Angela finds uh, Terry and gives her the, the kiss of, you know, damnation or whatever. Oh, yeah. And demons her up. No, no, the hand gag has been done before. I mean, I, I realize that, but never to the point of, hey, I'm just going to jerk this guy off, because I guess Angela's really horny, too. 
it's really good. I really, really like it. I, I think that, again, there are a lot of little moments in this movie that the gags go a little further than they would have in the original Night of the Demons, but that's kind of when I, I like it most. And anyway, so Rick has got, uh, Terry has got, um, the, uh, the basketball playing, uh, dude gets his head knocked off. Um, I'm trying to think who else dies in this spade. That might be it. It might be those guys. That's about the handful of them for sure. Yeah. And then... Angela grabs Mouse, and they all take off back to Hull House. And this is the point where Perry is like, "Oh my God, uh, they're they're going back to Hull House. Uh, clearly, there is a ritual that's going to be done, and it probably involves the death and or corruption of Mouse. And so, even though Father Damien is not down for this at all." Uh, he is brought along because he's like, well, we're going to go take care of the kids, but I don't believe any of this demon shit. Meanwhile, Sister Gloria completely rambos it up where she is taking her best yardstick and balloons full of holy water. Perry's getting a super soaker of holy water as well. And it's a real, like, montage sequence of we're about to go fuck up some demons. We, we didn't mention, but, you know, uh, Perry is played by Robert Jane, who you may know as Bobby Jacoby. He's like a genre favorite. He's in some stuff. Tremors and uh, Bloody Birthday. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most recently in those Mythica fantasy movies that are on Amazon. Oh, I don't even know what that is. Uh, yeah, you know, they're not great, but it's kind of interesting to see low-budget fantasy done like full on series style where they've made four or five of them at this point. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, streaming's the way. People go said, "Oh, I and mean, this is like a, a side here, but Dune did really well, but only because it was on HBO Max. Because you and I both know that you know you make these niche sci-fi films for for theaters, they ain't gonna do so good on their own." Yeah, I wonder about that. I mean, I'm I'm a big Denis Villeneuve fan. So I would see Dune anyway, although I haven't yet, but that's just because Halloween stuff. But gotcha. Um, but I definitely will, you know. Like, but I'm gonna go to the theater for that. I I, I like Dune enough because I'm a big fan of Lynch's Dune, and I've read some of the book. It's a little dry for my taste, but it's interesting. And because of all the spices, that's why it's so dry. So, you know, <laughs> that's right. It <laughs> turns out that the spices are cinnamon. Uh, it just dries you right up turns you into one big pucker but you know, uh, uh sorry about that guys <laughs> yeah but uh but yeah i mean i i i think you're right i think that it was something that I, w- I was thinking about when you know we talked about charles band before the show started and the argument at the time of vhs was that if we make vhs tapes affordable then people will stop going to the movies and it's the same argument that you hear about streaming now. Like, well, if you make it too convenient, people are just going to stop going to the movies. And it's like, nah, people are still going to go to the movies to see the stuff that, you know, seems like movie-worthy, theater-worthy stuff. Well, you're, you're in age now, with in, in this age, 94, to where a lot of these sequels were being released direct to DVD and even even decent horror films. One of my favorite horror films of the 90s is Ticks, and people may not have seen it, but I can appreciate everything about it. But that didn't have a theatrical release, but it had a lot of, a lot of names, you know, and the, like, like you said, you could sell a movie like this to VHS audiences when, you know, you know, fancy that. Video stores were still really a, a thriving thing in 94, and you could slap this on the wall with, you know, Ticks and pumpkin head 2 and all kinds of other stuff that went direct to video and you can say hey i i seen the first one you know I, i'll pick up this one so i think the vhs market is, is still very important for for films like this and it, it's, it's it's success because i've seen this on cable but i i rented it first multiple times so oh that. for sure yeah, yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, I was I, again just something I was thinking about earlier today was wandering through the aisles and video stores, and that the modern equivalent of that is just scrolling through like the categories on Amazon or Netflix or something. And it's not the same because you know, you click on something to read everything about the film now the actors and the you other know, the crew and you know you, you were at the video store you were lucky you flipped that tape over because it was sold on the cover art you know absolutely plus you were stuck with it you know mm-hmm. like once you had rented it you kind of saw it through you know or or it was just so bad that you couldn't but one way or the other like you had that tape you it wasn't like you could just stop it and then flip over to the next movie the way you can now like oh, yeah. you, you were sort of pot committed to i'm gonna watch this movie come hell or high water and even if it's not very good i'm probably still gonna finish it because i rented a movie to watch tonight and here we I, are i spent two dollars on this movie for for three nights and i'm gonna sit and watch it probably more than once you know oh for sure absolutely <laughs> And I mean, especially if it was any good, you know, you'd watch it a couple of times. Or if you were like me in a big chicken, you rented Evil Dead and couldn't finish it the first night, mm-hmm. you know, there you go. Uh, and then had to watch it again later because it was so scary. But <laughs> yeah, VHS culture, though, you gotta, you gotta love it. And it made, it made films like this all the much better. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly a different era, but, uh, you know, also, you know, pining for it is sort of like pining for the days of buggy whips. It's like, eh, just technology has moved on, and we're just never going to go back to that. But and, it was—it was, was the, the freedoms of this. I'm, I'm sorry to go back to this again, but they, they, they can easily make this film unrated and put it put and distribute it to, to video stores because there is pubic hair in this movie. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting excited about this because you know we live in the age of the internet, so if I, I want to see pubic hair, I can just click a button. But um, in '94, you know, when I was 13 years old pornography wasn't what well established to to collect as a 13 year old boy mm-hmm. so you're lucky you found that porn in the woods that's the, the mythical porn in the woods but uh, i digress so films like this that we can say hey you know mom i rented night of the demons too she don't know what the fuck you're talking about but you're seeing all these boobs and you know full frontal nudity as a, as a 13 year old horned up you know freak you know I'm a little more reserved now, but at 13 years old, it's like much, much like most 13 year old guys I know, you know, when they were 13, we're some horned up little bastards. And this film fits, fits that bill. And I think it, the, 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 the fact that it came to VHS and not the theaters well, made it all that much better. Yeah. Well, and technically Die of the Demons 2 is a theatrical release. It's got an MPAA rating. Oh yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 It's, it, well, uh, in fact, Brian Trenchard Smith talked a lot about how he filmed everything that he thought the MPAA would have a problem with. He filmed twice as much of it so that he could (laughs) cut half of it and it would still be gory and lots of nudity and that kind of thing. I got you. I'm sorry. We'll go go back to the story. (laughs) Yeah, no, but uh, Night of the Demons 3 is the first in the series that was straight to home video. But no, your point is absolutely right. Like, you know, uh, there there was that entire market of, hey, we're going to release this straight to video unrated, and then we can do whatever the fuck we want. You know, like, if, if we're not going through the MPAA, then who cares? Uh, which I appreciate. I like those movies quite a bit. Um, but, and, you know, that's why, what, Reanimator was rated X, I think? Yep. Um, anywho. Uh, but, yeah, so we're, we're, oh, yeah, yeah, so we're going back to Whole House. Like, everybody gears up. And so it's like BB and Sister Gloria and Perry and uh, Father Bob and... Uh, bb's boyfriend is along for the ride as well and so they uh get to whole house they end up looking around for mouse and are separated very very quickly uh, at, the, at, the je- at the jest of father bob she said that's a good idea because you, you and i both thought it's a bad idea so <laughs> yeah yeah they they <laughs> Yeah, they up the pheromones so that they're like, oh, yeah, we should split up. Um, but Father Bob and Perry end up together. 
and they run into Rick. And I like this scene quite a bit as well, where Rick, uh, but he's kind of in shadows, and you know you can tell he's got the demon voice going on, but he's like, you know, Father, do you mind if I give you my confession? And Father Bob's like, well, I mean, now doesn't seem like the time, but all right. And uh, he's like, well, forgive me because I'm about to sin. I'm about to kill you. And and sure enough, does just straight up stabs <laughs> Father Bob to death. You got to talk about skeptical Father Bob here because he's a, he's an idiot at this point because we open up on on um, our our friend here who's bouncing his decapitated head on the ground and shooting in a basketball hoop that's conveniently placed at Hall House and he thinks there's not a problem with this you know he's still still skeptical Father Bob yeah yeah Uh, and I I do like the basketball playing demon I think that's pretty fun and again something that is a little more goofy and freewheeling than the first night of the demons for sure it makes a bouncing sound effect, but he's bouncing his decapitated head off the ground, which would not work in in real life, but in in Hull House, all bets are off. That's kind of the thing, is Hull House lives by its own set of rules, so uh, as you said, it's sort of a whatever happens in Hull House stays in Hull House kind of situation. But, uh, yeah, so Rick kills Father Bob, and then Perry... Uh, kills Rick with his super soaker full of holy water. And so we learn at this point that if you just explode a uh, water balloon of holy water on a demon's head, it will melt into a puddle of goo. Well, the weaker ones. Right. Yeah, it doesn't work on Angela. But we also run into Terry, and they end up just jamming holy water down her throat and she just pukes up the evil and she's cool again which is a new twist on what's going on in Hull House and they have no reason to know if this is going to work or not it could be like boiled in her insides it's like okay get 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 the devil out of you come on, come on. it's like the it's like that girl that, that takes her girlfriend to the bathroom but she's too drunk at the party just I'll hold your hair. You, you throw up in the bowl, honey. You know, <laughs> right? Oh, beetles. That, that's unexpected. Um, yeah, but you know, but it's either way your problem solved. If you dump holy water down her throat and she is no longer evil, great. Or it just eats her alive from the inside out. Either way, you no longer have a demon problem. There's never that that moment of the, that when that happens. I would say, "Holy shit, it works!" You know, <laughs> but um. Because they had no idea it was going to work. Right, right. Um, then the there's the, uh, the like we said, there there's the guy playing basketball with his own head, and he's going to eat his friend and turn him into a demon. But Perry comes along just in time and melts him as well. Actually, kicks his head, just yells field goal and kicks his decapitated head off into the distance and then melts his body. It's like, God, wrong game, bro. Come on now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, <laughs> I like the fact that this demon yells, hey, where's the referee? I think that's pretty funny. Technical foul. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very <laughs> silly, but I like it. And uh, then we have Z-Boy, one of our original demons in this movie, he ends up hitting Perry in the fucking skull with a baseball bat with a bunch of nails sticking out of it. That he brings to the party. Mm-hmm. Who, who, who does that? Brings brings the baseball bat with the nails uh, in it into a party, but he might need that one day. And he, this was the moment. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. So he ends up getting, uh, Perry ends up getting killed by that. And he's about to demon out. But he has uh, his buddy, the BB's boyfriend, give him a bunch of holy water so that he can die in a state of grace or whatever. So he doesn't demon out. And who are we missing? Who who did we not? Uh, Rick's Rick's already gone. Z Boy's gone. The basketball guy's gone. Christine uh, Taylor is cool. Um, 
Oh, Shirley. Yeah, so it's it's Shirley and Z Boy. Uh, or no, no, it's Shirley and uh, and Father Bob. He gets demoned out, and so they're coming for um, Terry and the boyfriend, and then. Uh, the boyfriend ends up using a bunch of holy water to melt both of them into a big society puddle where it's like Shirley's legs and Father Bob's torso and a big puddle of shit in between them. And so that kills them. And and anyway, so you get down to Sister, Sister Gloria, BB, her boyfriend... And they're and they've killed all the other demons, and they're on the hunt for Angela and Mouse, who they ultimately find in like this upper room where Angela is about to do this ritual, and she's got Mouse on this altar, and Sister Gloria, uh, like they tried to do the uh, uh, holy water water balloons and whatnot. And none of that is working because Angela's just too powerful for that stuff. But she says, if you want to trade places, <laughs> the way that Angela puts it is, come on, sister, kick the habit. Trade places with her and I'll let Mouse go. And she also puts some kind of kibosh on uh, BB and her boyfriend who are just kind of writhing on the ground like they're paralyzed and in pain. And uh, then Angela, what? Well, oh, Angela at first tries to decapitate Sister Gloria, who hides her head in her habit super fast. She, she wore that extra large habit that day. Yeah, yeah, and and is able to just sneak her head down. And yeah, and then ends up trading places with Mouse, and. Then Angela gives Mouse the knife and is like, hey, if you kill her, you'll be super powerful and evil like me. And you'll have all her spiritual power, only it'll be evil. So all you've got to do to be with me, your sister, forever, is to kill this nun. And Mouse, of course, does not do that. She, you know, kills Angela. Or stabs her. And then Sister Gloria pops up and then shoots a super soaker of holy water onto Angela and she kind of melts into a pile of shit. But Gary, Angela is not done. Oh, that she's not. So as our heroes are trying to leave, the our four heroes now, um, Angela shows back up as a big snake monster. And it looks real good, too, I gotta say, from a low-budget film that this looks uh, pretty phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, again, this is all Steve Johnson stuff, uh, you know, who worked on the first one and did Ghostbusters and a, a bunch of other movies. He's a very talented makeup artist. And I thought it was cool. The, uh, the way that they did the snake is they, you know, had Amelia Kincaid in that upper body prosthetic and put her on essentially a teeter-totter so that she could rise and fall like she's standing on her tail. It's mm -hmm. Very simple but very clever. I really like it. It looks really good. And uh, our our hero, BB's boyfriend, um, ends up kicking a cross into <laughs> the boarded-up window because... Perfect cross, yes. Yeah, because he knows... Karate. Karate. Which he, he uses throughout the film. He tries to kick in, kick in doors and, you know, whatever. He just, uh, he's a karate man, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, to, Eddie, like Eddie Murphy in Trading Places. <laughs> right. To this film's credit, it is firmly established that this guy knows karate. And, uh, yeah, so he kicks a, a cross into a window and then sunlight comes through and the sunlight cross lands on Angela, and she blows up. Yeah, I mean, it's established in the first film that they have, if they can survive the night, you know, once the sunlight comes up, it'll it'll kill whatever demons that are left. And yeah. 
it, it respects the first the first you know again same writer so mm -hmm. i think that helps things and it, it also helps you know this film just jump the shark enough to say you know what if you like Night of the demons you're probably gonna have a really good time in Night of the demons too and they're not wrong yeah so we go back to saint rita's and everybody is fine uh our heroes are saved except before the credits roll we see uh one of the girls who was naked earlier in the movie um in the first shot find the tube of lipstick and she opens it up and a cgi snake comes out of it and uh it eats the camera and then you see, you know, directed by Brian Trenchard Smith. To... I mean, the only re the only real flaw of the movie is that final shot for me. It's terrible you know, I mean, CGI. It's it's silly the movie throughout, but that's that's the only thing that's real cheap about this movie is that final shot. It looks very cartoony, and not in the way that like, oh well, in Anaconda, that snake looks kind of fakey sometimes. This just looks like a Saturday morning cartoon snake. This looks like the Scorpions at the beginning of uh, 3,000 Miles of Graceland, which is a film that I I, I, un, I unapologetically love. But uh, there's a, a CGI scorpion fight at the beginning of that film for no effing reason, and that's what this looks like, when they could have just did the same the same effect, the same phallic you know thing popping out of there, and just say, hey, yeah, this happened earlier in the film, and now it's going to happen again. And... It, it wasn't necessary, Mr. Brian Trenchard Smith, to have that in there. Right, right. Just have the, like, what you saw with Terry earlier, or BB earlier, when she opens it up, and it kind of comes at the camera and just cut to black on that. Because you already know how to do that gag, but, eh, whatever. Um, and so that's it. That is the, the story, the broad strokes of the story of Night of the Demons 2. And that brings us to uh the performances in the film and i would argue gary that this has a better cast than the first film oh yeah and i'm i'm a i'm a linnea quickly apologist and completist and her the lack of linnea in this film is more than made up by uh bad girl shirley who like like you said i, I wish she'd done more because she she established herself pretty well as like this bad girl and even if it was shit, I'd watch. I'd watch more stuff with her in it. And Christine Taylor, who's the good girl but the bad girl, as Terry. And it was really strange as a Nickelodeon kid to see Melody from Hey Dude, you know, being all horned up in this movie. And uh, that's a uh, because she's pretty wholesome on that 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 show in which multi ethnic kids watch a dude ranch for some white dude. You know? <laughs> Is that was that Christine um, Taylor who did that? Was she in Hey Dude? Chris, yeah, that, that was that was her from Hey Dude. Yeah, from the Nickelodeon show. I had no idea. Yeah, that show ran for like six seasons. I think I, I think I watched them all because uh, there was uh, there was some pretty girls in that show too. But um, yeah, Robert Jane, you know, doing playing the same thing he always plays usually. But you know, he's he's a genre actor. And you got you gotta. You gotta love him and different stuff that he's in because he always brings something to the table and and uh the king the 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 one they always talk about in this movie is Sister Gloria uh, played by Jennifer Rhodes and always leaving some room for the Holy Ghost and being you know being campy but being serious at the same time which I think is a, a really good quality to the character and uh that's uh there's other good stuff you know but again Steve Johnson's effects. Made on a budget and looking good, and um, brought brought some more camp. I love it, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think Chrissy Harris is really good. I think Merle Kennedy as Mouse. I think she's great. Um, Rod McCary as Father Bob. He's very like he's exactly what you need him to be, which is just this skeptical dickhead that you're like in the face of everything that you are seeing tonight. You should allow for the fact that something supernatural is happening. He's just like, nope. I believe I'm going to sit here and read Catcher in the Rye. And everything's going to be cool. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think uh, uh, Robert Jane is is terrific in it. 
Um, yeah, it's just got a like top to bottom solid cast. And uh, so I think on that level alone, there there are those elements make it more feel more substantial than the original Night of the Demons, which I, I like a lot, but Oh, I do too. Um I, I just think this has a better cast. And then when moving to the idea of the themes of the movie, again, this is not a super deep movie that's looking at heavy uh, concepts of religion and faith or anything like that, but it does play around with a lot of Catholic tropes and uh, has some fun with being slightly, you know, in your face uh, about uh, being a bit subversive, like when Mouse has her nightmare of Angela coming oh, to her the, uh, for I the first time. Yeah, and when when that first happens, it is six oh six and six sec- seconds in the morning, mm-hmm. and it's like uh, you know those little things are nice touches. Like this is a movie that people cared about enough to just kind of pepper with little touches like that. Not to backtrack, but that effect where Angela visits Mouse in her dream and she rips her jawbone off Mm -hmm. is probably the best effect in the whole movie. It's really good. Yeah, it's really bloody and gross and gory. It looks really good. It's just a, you know, obviously it's just a jaw appliance that they used and, you know, ripped the skin off and whatnot, but it, it looks great. Um, there's another moment when Angela is going to try to get Mouse to go with her to Hull House, where they do a nice little camera trick where they hide the edit of her going from normal Angela to demon Angela. That That's pretty good. Um, but yeah, uh, the in addition to the, the kind of Catholic tropes, the other thing I would say is there's sort of a you know again this is kind of catholic but the idea of like all the characters that really get it in this movie are people who give in to temptation and like bb and her boyfriend survived but they're also the ones that like used a condom and you know weren't complete just horn dogs through the whole movie they were horny and they fucked but they didn't do it irresponsibly and they weren't shitty to mouse and if you can do those two things within the confines of Night of the Demons 2, you can survive this movie. I mean, I, I have the same complaint that some folks have about Night of the Demons. I'd say about a third of the horror-watching population is that the first one, the third act is not great. It kind of falls apart a little bit compared to what you've been watching in the first, this, uh, first and second half, or first and second acts of the film. This one I don't have that problem with. So this so this is why I prefer Night of the Demons 2 over Night of the Demons. Yeah, and that kind of brings... Yeah, I, I think that le- leads us into sort of final thoughts of the movie. But I totally agree with you, man. I think that this movie... It it just has more of a story going on with the fact that you've, you're dealing with Angela's younger sister. You've got Perry and his demonology... Uh, interests and th- the setting of this Catholic school makes it more interesting and it becomes sort of a battle between good versus evil as opposed to a bunch of teenagers getting you know messed up in the first one whereas this is like oh we're about to go do battle with the forces of evil with Sister Gloria and her ragtag group of you know misfits out to rescue Mouse. And that to me is way more compelling and more interesting than oh we've just got to get out of this house. Yeah, this is true. I mean, I when uh, I will go into the final thoughts and everything that that, that happened. But yeah, I, I agree, and this is I think why well, why Amelia and Kate loves the film more than the first one. And I I had a whole conversation with her, but she she right away agreed with me that the second one is better than the first one with Linnea right next to her. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it wasn't even like a, it wasn't even like, Hey, let me insult my co-star and this, and this woman that she, she still very much loves. I mean, they, they have a great friendship. 
and um, she just likes it like I like it, and that kind of makes me happy. Oh yeah, for sure. It's you know it is equally, if not more, sexy than the first one. You know, I mean, it's just filled with and. It, you know, th- this is part of the the thing that I always wrestle with when it comes to horror films, especially horror films of this era, where it's like, well, you don't want it to just be a TNA movie, but if that you're kind of exploding the parts of the first movie, where the first movie was like, well, this is kind of sex, and we've got Linnea Quigley uh, showing off her breasts, which is unsurprising. We've got uh, Amelia Kincaid doing this sexy dance before she mess a stooge up and in this one it's like oh no no we're just gonna start with tits and go from there and so when you see nudity it is in no way surprising but it's like we're gonna get the most beautiful girls that we possibly can to show off a little tna and then we're gonna pair that with a movie that is arguably more gory than the first one and it also is funnier and sillier than the first one and so it's like it's it's the spinal tap joke of like well this one goes to 11 (laughs) you know (laughs) like well why not make it 10 but this one just like it does everything that the first one does but it also has more fun with the concept it gets away from whole house for a little bit just to come back to it it's got way more story the characters i think even though some of them are totally disposable and they're just there to be, you know, kids who turn into demons so we can kill them off. But, you know, Perry is kind of a tragic character who is trying to do the right thing and leads everyone to whole house to save the day and ends up getting killed for his efforts. Uh, You know, that kind of stuff I think really works in this movie. Yeah, totally works for this movie and it works, it works to its detriment and, it works oh so well. I mean, if you haven't, if you haven't, if we haven't convinced you to watch it, I mean, <laughs> see, I really liked it. Night of the Demons, the first one, but I'm not sure because you know there's always the law of diminishing returns, and this one doesn't have that. So you could go for that, you know. Yeah, for sure. So I w- all right. Let's get to ratings here. As always, it is a uh, five star scale. We do allow for half stars on this show, but not quarter stars because we're not monsters. So, uh, on a scale of five stars, Gary, where do you land on Night of the Demons 2? Oh, I got it rated in the genre that it's in. You know, it's, it's not Citizen Kane or anything, but in, in, in the genre that it's in, it, it gets an easy four out of five for me because I, I have fun from start to finish. It's cheesy from the beginning, great gore, uh... A lot of MVPs in this movie. One I didn't mention was uh, the actor plays Z Boy, uh, Darren Heems. He's been he done a bunch of stuff uh, mm-hmm. in the '90s and beyond because he's still acting today. But uh, highlights of his career is he plays an early death in Doctor Giggle, Doctor Giggles, which is a film that I I can love uh, because Larry Drake is all in in that movie, just like Angel is in this movie. Um, he played Dave number two in PCU. If you've seen PCU, you know why he's Dave number two. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the, the nineties version of animal house with, with Jeremy Piven. If you guys don't know what that is. Um, one of my favorite episodes of Buffy ever is where Xander runs into a bad crowd and there's zombies and they want to blow up, blow open the hell mouth. And he plays one of the, one of the three zombies that, that Xander falls in a bad crowd with. And, um, yeah. A, yeah. a, a great episode so, called the Zeppo is the name the of that Zeppo, episode. Yes. Yeah. It's good. It's really good. One of the one of the highlights of well, season three is a banger anyway. I, I I can go on and on about Buffy, but I'm not I'm not gonna do that. But uh but yeah, I, I think it's important just to, to say, you know, not just the film, but you know, I, I gotta mention this, I don't know if it was mentioned in the first episode. You, you know you know what Amelia Kincaid Kate does now for for a living? Hmm. She's like animal spiritualist. She's written books on the subject. She she goes to visit places anywhere from she has seminars anywhere from little dogs to like big cats in Africa. So if you haven't, I and I I got her her first her first book and her second book, and you know losing an animal, you know, <laughs> it's a good read. You, you might cry through part of it, but she she's she's all into that. And if you don't know, uh. 
look it up. She she she, she does summon her. You can bring your your animals in there and she'll if they're troubled or whatnot, you know. Because I hate these people to say, oh, they're just pets, and you know, they're, no, they're members of your family, and they're conflicted like anybody else. And I'm glad that 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 she does that for a living. And uh, the the niece of Rue McClanahan, by the way, just just throw that out there too, because oh, I, I love right. my go- I love my Golden Girls. I'm sure you do too. Just, oh, uh, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, for sure. Um, um, that's it, though. I'm sorry. No, 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 not at all. Uh, so, yeah, I think I agree with you, Gary. I, 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 I gave Night of the Demons three and a half. I think this is better in most regards, but also, you know, it's not high art. But if you want a great Saturday night movie, Night of the Demons two is tough to beat. It's it's fun. It's like I said, it's it's sexy, it's gory, it's silly, it's all the things that you want from a movie of this era. And yeah, I kind of love it. I kind of love Night of the Demons 2. In fact, Night of the Demons 2 is kind of the reason I wanted to do this whole series is to talk about parts 2 and 3 more than the first one. Um, so... Oh, 100% man. I was I was all aboard when you said, you know, but I would have took... The, the latter, which is Return of the Living Dead Part 3 when you asked, you know, who wanted to be on there but I really, really wanted this one, so I'm glad that I got to be on this one. Yeah, it's I, same, because I think you and I are both big fans of this so, uh, alright Gary, we're gonna wrap this up with three things that you may not know about Night of the Demons 2 uh, One, speaking of the uh, actors in the film, Zoe Trilling, who we were both saying should have done more stuff um, kind of disappeared from movies after a while. She did a few more, uh, worked with Toby Hooper, but then just disappeared. Nobody really knows much about her post movie career. The best uh, hint that we have is from a LinkedIn profile that suggests that she now works as an HR director at a financial firm in LA. Oh, so it's a job, you know, nine, nine to fiver. Yeah, I not complaining, but uh, boy, it just like I said, just seems like she should have uh, had a bigger career. Um, she, she, I know she probably doesn't need that con money, but she she can make that con money. Is all I'm saying. You she a hundred percent. So, uh, you may not know that Night of the Demons two reuses a fair amount of footage from the original Night of the Demons, including the shots of Angela floating down the hallway, as well as uh, a scene of the character Johnny jumping out a window is actually a stuntman from Night of the Demons uh, jumping out a window instead. So yeah. that incre- incredibly well done because I, I didn't I didn't notice any of these things and I I watched the first one often as probably as often as this one. All right, and then uh, our final thing that you probably don't know about Night of the Demons too is that Christy Harris, who of course appears uh, topless as BB in the film, was 16 when she filmed it. Mm. Um, yeah, and um. Uh, you know, I say that so every time that y- we as grown ass people see this movie and think to ourselves, that is one sexy broad. Remember, she is a child, everyone. That is a child. At, at that point, yeah, she is a child. And I feel, uh, I feel bad, you know, for that. And, you know, that, that's, um, that's unfortunate, you know, but she, she is probably non union. She needed the money. And, you know, Maybe she's estranged from her parents. I don't know what's going on there, but that's 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 bad either way. It's irresponsible. But, um, yeah, uh, but uh, I'm gonna but, give one more bonus thing that you may not know about this movie, just so we don't end on on a creepy one. Well, if you, I, I'd say something because I, it's a kind of like a that '70s show situation to where Mila Kunis lied about her age to be on the show, and she may have falsified some documents to be in this movie. I I, I don't know for sure, but you know. Well, is she went in call Brian Trenchard Smith. I can't call Brian Trenchard Smith irresponsible all the way, you know, because he may have not known that information. I I think he was aware and it was I think it was a thing that was kind of in her contract and she knew like, hey, I'm gonna do this topless scene, but also 
the way that she put it was you know it seemed like it, it was real fast but then when you see the movie cut together it's like oh they used every second it does linger yes yeah so uh but again here's one bonus one uh just just to take the creep factor off a little bit so uh towards the end of shooting when they were doing some of the whole house stuff everybody uh, on the set or almost everybody on the set got the flu and including christy harris who was so sick that she had to get a couple of days off, which coincided with the studio seeing a bunch of the dailies come in from the movie, uh, that, especially a lot of the stuff that was uh, on campus. And they really liked it. They, saw, they liked what they saw coming out of uh, Brian Trenchard Smith. So they offered him another $150,000 to do a couple of extra days of shooting and to have a bigger finale. So the entire sequence with the snake at the end of the movie, not in the original script, not even part of the shooting script. It was added after Brian Trenchard Smith turned in some footage. The studio liked it, gave him extra money and said, we want you to do a big special effects ending. And so this is what they came up with and uh yeah so that the whole reason there is a snake sequence uh with angela at the end of this movie is because brian trenchard smith doing a good job and they gave him some more money to make it even better if you, if you look at the wiki the budget says 1.4 million or 2.7 million so maybe the 2.7 was after they gave him the extra money well, according to him, it was 1.4, and they gave an extra 150 grand for it. But, you know, who knows? Who, who knows what the real number is? All that Hollywood math. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, so that is it for Night of the Demons 2. As always, uh, I hope that you come out of this show a little bit smarter than you went into it. Um, also, Gary... I know we talked about it in the upfront, but give us yet another quick summary of all the different places that people can find you uh, after listening to this show. Okay. Uh, Cinema Beef Podcast, which I've been doing since about 2014, I believe. Uh, don't go looking for all the episodes because some of them don't exist anymore. Long story. Server lost them. Lost a backup in a fire. Blah, blah, blah. But the ones that exist are on legionpodcast.com and legion podcast feed and all that good stuff two drink minimum commentaries those are all there uh that's where i get together with a bunch of friends to watch a movie and not necessarily talk about facts about the movie but talk about you know <laughs> just just bullshit around probably talk about the same way the stuff we're talking about now like just you know ramming on jokes and ramming on women and you know and respectively of course if you think i'm a shit pig i'm when i record i'm about 60% me, but there's that 40% that has to have some kind of personality. So, it's, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's most podcasts, I think, though. Um, yeah, last, last Call of Torchies is the Walter Hill podcast I mentioned earlier. Uh, we Next episode coming of that should be the Long, Long Riders, followed by Southern Comfort. Um, the, the man had a, a banger of a, of a starter career, and then it deteriorates some towards the, the end there, but not not a lot for me. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. And Streets of Fire, again, I know people. I, I've, I've been on multiple shows about it, and, but it's coming. It's coming. A little Tom Cody for you, coming at you. Yeah. And uh, the last one I'll mention is Blood from the Core, because that is a Patreon exclusive to Legion, myself, and uh, Derek Bourgeois for many podcasts as well, uh, talk about New York based horror and thriller films the next one that you should hear of that should be Too Scared to Scream which is uh, where Ian McShane works at a at a hotel and he's murdering the tenants of the hotel and it's nice to see a young a 